Whenever socialist revolution is mentioned, the first images that spring to mind might be of the masses of Russian workers storming the Winter Palace, or perhaps of old photographs of Che Guevara and his small bands of guerrillas. In Ireland, whenever socialist republicans think of revolution, we often call back to heroic depictions of the GPO aflame during the 1916 Rising, or of the pikes of the United Irishmen during the 1798 Rebellion. All of these images are certainly useful points of reference for our minds to begin to sketch out an understanding of what a revolution is and what it involves. However, we often find ourselves thinking of revolutions as historical events of the bygone past, rather than as living, ongoing processes happening right now at this very moment. This video will hopefully serve as a snapshot of one of the most advanced examples of an ongoing communist-led revolution in the world today, namely the National Democratic Revolution in the Philippines. This revolution, involving hundreds of thousands of dedicated revolutionaries and progressives within a support base of millions, is fighting to change Filipino society in a truly radical way by breaking the chains of imperialism, semi-feudalism and bureaucrat capitalism, paving the way for future socialist society. Today we're going to take a look at this revolution's history, its theory and its practice. In 1968, a storm swept over the Philippines, a materially rich Southeast Asian nation of 7,641 islands. The country's Communist Party, the Communist Party of the Philippines, having already been founded in 1930 by Crisanto Evangelista, was effectively refounded 35 years later as a principled revolutionary organization. The Philippines had a long history of revolution under both Spanish and US colonialism in its past, begun by the movement of Andreas Bonifacio, who's honoured by the National Democratic Revolution as the founding father of modern Filipino anti-imperialism. Bonifacio's revolutionary tradition was revitalised by the new CPP leadership. This event was known as the First Great Rectification Movement. The rectification, led by figures such as Jose Maria Sison, one of the founders of the youth organisation Kabatang Makabayan, broke from the old party leadership of Hizuslava, which chose to abandon the struggle previously fought by the Huk Balahap, the communist guerrilla force which had fought against Japanese occupation during the Second World War by effectively dissolving the party. Many Huk Balahap veterans would play key roles in the initiation of the National Democratic Revolution which would soon follow. And apologies for the terrible pronunciations, there's undoubtedly going to be many, many more in this video to come. The rectification was heavily influenced by the Sino-Soviet split between the revisionist USSR led by Khrushchev and the revolutionary People's Republic of China led by Chairman Mao. The revolutionaries took up the theories of Mao Zedong, at the time called Mao Zedong Thought, and applied it to the conditions of the Philippines. In his book written shortly after the rectification took place, Sison commented on the importance of the Chinese experience to the foundation of the Filipino movement, writing that, the universal theory of Marxism-Leninism Mao Zedong thought and the great proletarian cultural revolution have already had an incalculable impact on the concrete practice of the Philippine revolution. The new Mao Zedong thought line of the Communist Party of the Philippines certainly contrasted the pro-Soviet line of the old leadership, which continued to support the Soviet Union while its social imperialist enterprises joined in on the plunder of the natural resources of the Philippines. Continuing the tradition of opposition to imperialism and modern revisionism, the CPP today opposes US imperialist domination of the Philippines primarily, but also Chinese social imperialist exploitation as well, which has taken the place of the Soviets. At the time, the Philippines was ruled by the brutal dictator and kleptocrat Ferdinand Marcos, the father of the current president Bongbong Marcos. The Marcos regime was marked by years of martial law, the presence of US military bases, over 1,996 forced disappearances, mass malnutrition, and previously, according to the Guinness Book of Records, the greatest robbery of a government through Marcos's rampant pocketing of huge sums of money. Of course, this record was mysteriously removed from the Guinness Book of Records website in the aftermath of the election of his son this year. As expressed in one of the most important documents of the rectification, Rectify Our Errors and Rebuild the Party, Sison identified Mao's military theory of protracted people's war as necessary to resist Marcos's rule. And after the party leadership re-established the CPP, they wasted no time in initiating it. On the 29th of March 1969, members of the Communist Party of the Philippines, Kabatang Makabayan and Huk Balahap, formed the New People's Army to begin the People's Democratic Revolution put forward by the CPP's new, rejuvenated and revolutionary political line. Beginning in the countryside with only 60 fighters, the NPA would quickly see exponential growth. 
CSUN reported that by 1972, just three years later, the NPA had increased in size to 800 dedicated Red Fighters. These ranks would continue to swell despite the repression implemented by Marcos with the aid of the US military, which was fighting to kill off a number of other revolutionary struggles in Southeast Asia at the time, such as the Vietnamese resistance which at the time of the foundation of the New People's Army was at its peak. Sison himself would fall victim to this repression when he was arrested and tortured for nearly nine years in 1977. This fate would be shared by many of the revolutionary leaders, such as one of the NPA's founders, Comrade Dante, who disappeared from revolutionary politics after his release. However, despite the constant loss of leading figures of the CPP and NPA, the revolution would continue to march steadily forward and maintain a firm revolutionary political line. In 1973, the mass front of the National Democratic Revolution, the National Democratic Front of the Philippines, was founded of which the New People's Army, Capitan Macabayan and the Communist Party of the Philippines are member organisations, alongside the likes of Makiki Baca, the women's wing of the revolution. The National Democratic Front of the Philippines is broad in scope by design, seeking to unite the Filipino revolution with what it calls the Progressive Alliance. The Communist Party of the Philippines, the New People's Army and the National Democratic Front all form the three key cornerstones of what Chairman Mao called the three magic weapons of the revolution the Communist Party, the People's Army and the United Front. The key events in the initiation of the National Democratic Revolution aligned with the 1970 First Quarter Storm, which was a time of extreme urban unrest and huge growth in the Philippines for radical politics in the youth. In response to the First Quarter Storm and the beginning of the revolution, Ferdinand Marcos would declare martial law, which he would use to assume total power for years. Marcos would later be overthrown in what's known as the Democratic EDSA Revolution, although he was replaced by Cory Aquino's US-backed government, which, despite releasing political prisoners from the CPP such as CISOM, quickly resumed the repressive policies of the Filipino Comprador state. Events such as the 1987 Mendiola Massacre were instrumental in the CPP's decision to continue its revolution against all of the successive post-Marcos Comprador regimes regardless of whether or not they wore a more progressive, liberal, friendly mask. The EDSA revolution was certainly a successful mass movement, but without the revolutionary transformation of the ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange, a transformation of the society's relations of production, a change of the Filipino state's true class character remained impossible. Since then, the CPP also went through a second great rectification beginning in 1991, this time against what it deemed left deviationists rather than right opportunists, or as they were known, the rejectionists. Since the breakaway of the rejectionists, they've largely fallen into sectarianism and obscurity, buried by history. This reminds us of the importance of never venturing too far ahead of the masses with left opportunism, nor lagging behind with right opportunism in the building of a successful revolutionary political line. As mentioned earlier, the People's Democratic Revolution, through organizations such as the National Democratic Front, aims to unite a broad base of the Filipino people under what it calls national democracy. National democracy, in summary, is the program of the Filipino Revolution which unites all classes and strata hostile to semi-feudalism and imperialism under the leadership of the proletariat to build new democracy, similar to the program of the Chinese Revolution in 1949. The National Democratic Revolution lays the ground for the development towards socialism by eliminating semi-feudalism and bureaucrat capitalism and progressing forward through successive proletarian cultural revolutions. Today, the program of national democracy is outlined by a 12-point program. The 12-point program of the National Democratic Front of the Philippines reads as follows. 1. Unite the people for the overthrow of the semi-colonial and semi-feudal system through a people's war and for the completion of the National Democratic Revolution. 2. Establish a People's Democratic Republic and a Democratic Coalition Government. 3. Build the People's Army and a People's Defense System. 4. Uphold and promote the People's Democratic Rights. 5. Terminate all unequal relations with the United States and other foreign entities. 6. Implement genuine agrarian reform, promote cultural cooperation, raise rural production and employment through modernization of agriculture and rural industrialization and ensure agricultural sustainability. 
7. Break the US big comprador landlord dominance over the economy. Carry out national industrialization and build an independent and self-reliant economy. 8. Adopt a comprehensive and progressive social policy. 9. Promote a national and progressive people's culture. 10. Uphold the rights of the Bangsamoro and the Cordillera peoples and other indigenous peoples to self-determination and democracy. 11. Advance the revolutionary emancipation of women in all spheres. 12. Adopt an active, independent and peaceful foreign policy. For those familiar with the Chinese Revolution, it should be apparent that national democracy is, as mentioned earlier, in line with the new democratic strategy of Chairman Mao and the CPC. Additionally, the strategy of the New People's Army, the Protracted People's War, is also derived from the same strategy that was used in the Chinese Revolution of developing a people's army in the countryside to wage guerrilla warfare and surround the cities. This is in line with Chairman Mao's initial conception of PPW in semi-feudal, semi-colonial countries like China prior to 1949 and the Philippines today. The Communist Party of the Philippines states that it upholds Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, which it asserts is the universally applicable ideology which has provided the solution to the basic problems which lay in front of them and a groundwork for revolution and building a socialist society in the future. For example, the CPP uses the Maoist method of criticism and self-criticism in its practice, although CISON adapted the Unity Criticism Unity model of Mao to the Filipino Unity Criticism Repudiation Unity model. While the CPP initially referred to its ideology as Marxism-Leninism Mao Zedong taught, it began referring to itself as Marxist-Leninist Maoist in 1994, after the term was first officially used by the Communist Party of Peru in 1983. Guided by Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, the Filipino Revolution is the largest ongoing communist revolution in the world today, demonstrating the relevance of this ideology when applied creatively by revolutionaries who are deeply rooted in and connected to the masses. Now, there are two main components of the National Democratic Revolution. The above-ground, legal, mass struggle led by National Democratic Mass Organizations, or NDMOs for short, and the underground, illegal, armed struggle led by the underground revolutionary organizations and the People's Army. The mass struggle is waged through various forms of organizations, such as trade unions, students' organizations, religious groups, farmers' groups, fishers' unions, women's organizations, musical bands and other forms of arts groups and artists' unions, indigenous rights groups for the indigenous lumads of the Philippines, associations of patriotic lawyers, and so on and so forth. With this mass reach, it can be safely estimated that national democracy has a support base of several million people in the Philippines alone. One way of gauging this figure is through the support they receive in elections. Although the National Democratic Front maintains the correct policy and stance of revolution hindi election, that is, revolution not election, Certain independent, legal, national democratic mass organizations might pursue their own independent tactics. It's important to note that in the mass legal struggle, many national democratic mass organizations, or NDMOs, and progressive groups are completely independent from and unaffiliated with the National Democratic Front or any of its organizations, and are thus free to pursue their own individual tactics of their own accord, even, in some cases, deciding to take part in elections. This is important to highlight since as of 2021, the National Democratic Front has been formally declared a quote, terrorist organization and has been forced largely underground. Although participation in bourgeois elections can and should be debated, one thing this tactic of certain National Democratic aligned candidates standing in elections through independent NDMOs provides is a snapshot into the rough scale of the civilian support base for the National Democratic Mass Movement. In this year's senatorial elections, for example, the National Democratic Filipino Human Rights Lawyer, Neri Colmenares, received a substantial 6,108,365 votes, just over 10% of the vote. Colmenares is a member of the large professedly National Democratic Coalition of Mass Organizations, Bagong Aliansang Makabayan. Bagong Aliansang Makabayan, founded during the Marcos dictatorship, is one of the most significant groupings of legal NDMOs, consisting of hundreds of thousands of members, many of whom work overseas through groups such as Anak Bayan. Now, when talking about any kind of connection between the above-ground, fully legal mass movement and the underground struggle, 
This needs to be spoken about with extreme caution. Legal National Democratic activists with no affiliation to the CPP, NPA, NDF are constantly accused by the Filipino government, now under the control of Ferdinand Marcos's son, of being so-called terrorists. This process, known as red tagging, has been used to silence political dissent in the Philippines for decades, and reached a new deadly height under the recently concluded presidency of the fascistic Rodrigo Duterte, who, similarly to Marcos before him, has now put one of his children in power as a way of continuing his political legacy, with his daughter Sarah Duterte now serving as vice president. To avoid accidentally red tagging innocent activists, it's crucial to always bear in mind the completely independent nature of the legal mass movement and the NDMOs. In any case, through rough estimation, it's more than likely that the broad stretches of the mass movement of the revolution operates within a support base of at least several million people. The Filipino People's War is ultimately the key part of the National Democratic Revolution as it offers armed resistance against the bureaucratic state and land-grabbing imperialist corporations from abroad. Following the strategy of protracted People's War, the New People's Army is in what's called the strategic defensive stage of the revolution. This form of protracted People's War is fought by forming guerrilla fronts in the countryside which work among the people in the local area and engage with enemy forces in sabotage and hit and run warfare. Similar tactics were employed, for example, by the Irish Republican Army and the National Liberation Front of Vietnam. A guerrilla front, when properly established, can create a red base area or a liberated zone in which national democratic policies can be safely implemented with the cooperation and participation of the local people, who form people's courts and councils that are secured and protected by the new people's army. In his recent lecture, Extreme Crisis and Urgent Tasks, Jose Maria Sison, observing from exile in the Netherlands, noted of the strength of the NPA and the CPP that, since the 2021 anniversary statement of the Communist Party of the Philippines and the 2022 anniversary statement of the New People's Army, the CPP Central Committee and the NPA National Operational Command have declared that the CPP has more than 150,000 cadres and members and party branches in all provinces of the Philippines and that the NPA has thousands of full-time red fighters plus auxiliary forces of tens of thousands as people's militia members and hundreds of thousands as members of self-defense units of revolutionary mass organizations in more than 110 guerrilla fronts in 74 out of 81 Philippine provinces. The Armed Forces of the Philippines Old State, or AFP, constantly makes gross underestimations of the NPA's strength to pretend that the People's War has been defeated, attempting to sow fear, doubt and uncertainty in the strategy of the Maoists. Unsurprisingly, given that they're complete fabrications, these claims often contradict one another. For example, on the 7th of July this year, the AFP made the claim that the NPA was down to only 2,000 fighters and only 23 guerrilla fronts. While 2,000 dedicated revolutionary red fighters would still be an extremely considerable force for rebuilding a people's war, the underestimation, as recently pointed out in the NPA's reply, is nonsensical and outlandish. The AFP further claimed that they had cut the NPA's strength down by 74%, which is especially interesting considering that if 2,000 is the remaining 26% of the NPA, then all the previous many dozens of claims by the AFP of the NPA being reduced to similarly low numbers for the last two decades have been lies, which they demonstrably have been. From this alone, it should be clear that the AFP is extremely dishonest in its ideological warfare and its physical warfare against the NPA. They use forced, quote, surrenders in order to show a supposed victorious campaign of counterinsurgency, when instead, they actually only parade civilians that they've accused of being NPA members in front of the media. Children are often the victims of these forced surrenders too attempting to support the ridiculous myth that the NPA recruits child soldiers. However, there's no material primary source evidence to support this myth whatsoever, and the NPA explicitly prohibits the recruitment of anyone under the age of 18, a minimum age of recruitment which is ironically higher than the AFPs, which is 17. The reason so many Filipinos join and dedicate their lives to the revolution is the extreme form of oppression that they face under the reactionary, bureaucratic, semi-feudal state under the boot of imperialism. 
Whether it's a peasant whose land is seized by a US agri-corporation, a fisherman whose coastal village is ploughed over for a development company, or put out of business by Chinese fishing vessels, or an urban sweatshop worker living in the slums forced to make cheap trinkets for next to nothing. There are thousands of personal stories from NPA fighters readily available in the CPP and NPA's publications such as Ang Bayan. Additionally, the NPA is extremely popular among all marginalized groups. In the Philippines, the LGBT plus community continues to be oppressed extremely brutally, so it's no wonder that numerous LGBT plus fighters are counted among the NPA's ranks. LGBT plus couples in the NPA enjoy equal loving relationships as comrades, and importantly, while gay marriage is still illegal today under the Philippines' old state, the NPA has been facilitating gay marriage ceremonies in its guerrilla camps since 2005. Women, who are often subject to particularly cruel patriarchal oppression in Filipino society, regularly join the NPA through revolutionary organizations such as Makiki Baka. One of the highest profile women in the NPA currently is Ka Katrin, a young guerrilla fighter who's achieved the rank of guerrilla commando and occasionally speaks as one of the many public faces of the army. The NPA holds extremely progressive and revolutionary policies against the patriarchy and the commodification of women. One of the three rules of discipline and eight points of attention, the guides of the Chinese People's Army which is now used by the NPA, states that the members of the People's Army must not take liberties with women. Violators of this policy are punished severely. An important part of the NPA's discipline is that its members must put aside any sexual urges and guarantee a safe environment for all making sure that all people, especially the vulnerable, are protected collectively by the party as a whole. Sexual abusers and rapists are subject to execution by the NPA, such as the known rapist in Escalante City who was found guilty by the People's Courts and put to death last year. On the NPA's policy on relationships for LGBT plus and women fighters, an LGBT plus member of the NPA, Ka Oliver, put it as such. In terms of relationships, my generation has been fed the idea that pride means being able to engage in anarchic sexual encounters with multiple partners with no compunction about consequences. Inside the movement, the CPP's policy on courtship and marriage aims to ensure that women and sexual minorities are being protected from violence, harassment and sexual opportunism. While the likes of Rodrigo Duterte called on his soldiers to mutilate captured Maoist women by shooting their genitals, the women of the NPA resist the patriarchal oppression of the Filipino state by fighting the AFP, who have a disgraceful track record of rape and sexual abuse of women in their counterinsurgency operations. Many Lumads, the indigenous people of the Philippines, also join the NPA as their ancestral lands are often under threat of bogus land seizures. They are regularly attacked by the AFP and threatened by politicians like Rodrigo Duterte, who even threatened to bomb Lumad schools in a public press release. In terms of the armed struggle, the NPA's weapons of choice usually rely heavily on rifles that have been confiscated from the armed forces of the Philippines, ensuring that the NPA's armed struggle is self-sufficient. It often employs the use of command-detonated explosives, forbidding the use of victim-detonated landmines to avoid civilian casualties and to adhere to the modern international rules of war. So strong is the NPA's commitment to the conventions of humane warfare, in fact, that in a recent video of an NPA raid on an AFP base released last year, NPA fighters were seen shouting, We are the NPA. The NPA abides by the rules of war. This was to assure the soldiers that were laying on the ground with their hands on their heads that they were safe and wouldn't be hurt. This commitment to the international rules of war, while perhaps not convenient for all armed struggles, is certainly a marker of how the NPA is truly a new type of army. An army of and for the people with an iron discipline unseen in any bourgeois standing army. NPA operations usually include raids on enemy bases to capture arms and ammunition, ambushes against AFP battalions in response to human rights abuses, harassment and sniping campaigns, and sabotage campaigns against imperialist enterprises from countries like the USA, Britain, Russia, Japan, China and so on. One example of this is the road that was being built to an incredibly destructive rare mineral mine being ambushed by the NPA last year. 
As a result of the NPA's campaign against extractive, destructive imperialist enterprises, the Filipino government is funded by imperialist countries looking to protect their plunder from the NPA. The governments of both Washington and Beijing have directly armed fascistic Filipino governments, particularly during the Duterte presidency, where bombs of all the major powers of the divided world all seemed to unite upon civilian targets and Lumad villages. EU and British arms companies also sell hundreds of millions of euros worth of stock to the Philippines. The EU's co-arm archive recorded massive sales from EU companies based in Spain and Germany of bombing equipment, explosives, small arms and chemical weapons for riot control. However, as evidenced by the NPA's continuous growth over 50 years to the level that it's at today, all these efforts appear to have been in vain. To conclude, the theory and practice of the National Democratic Revolution in the Philippines is a powerful argument for the creative, universal application of Marxism-Leninism-Maoism. It's united, exploited and oppressed people from all walks of life with a comprehensive analysis of class struggle and revolutionary science that paves the way for national liberation and socialist revolution. It's provided a direct, revolutionary solution to environmental destruction. It's pioneered the rights of Filipino women and LGBT plus people. And most importantly of all, it's produced some of the most experienced and advanced revolutions in the world today. It's a testament to the power of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism and of the relevance of communism today and into the future. While not all countries have the same semi-feudal and semi-colonial conditions of the Philippines, it's certain that we all have much to learn from their revolution that can be creatively applied to our own particular contexts. They truly are the trailblazers of our generation, along with their close allies in the Indian Maoist revolution which will be discussed in another video. For anyone looking to learn more about the revolution in the Philippines, a key text produced by the National Democratic Revolution, fundamental to understanding the history of the Philippines and its theory of revolution, is Jose Maria Sison's Philippine Society and Revolution, written in 1969 shortly after the first Great Rectification. For more information, you can check the CPP's official website, cpp.ph, where you can read their Central Committee's fortnightly publication, Ang Bayan, which is regularly published in many languages, including English. If you find the websites blocked in your country, try prwcinfo.wordpress.com and make sure to follow at prwc underscore info one on Twitter to keep up to date. Right, thanks very much for watching this video, hopefully you found it useful in one way or another. Thanks especially to the supporters on Patreon who continue to make each of these videos possible with their generous donations. Thank you Blue Collar Red, Julia Affentranger, BJB7, Gato Ansok, Ugopnik, Jacob Jaff, Grimwater, Borakua Gorilla, Ryan Hodgson, Soup, Michaela Schmidt, Christian Napales, Alfonso Dingo Torres, Rock Artist, Zakasi, Anglo Irish Bolshevik, Thomas Rosson Wood, Bobby Block, Jason Schmidt, Mitch Schiller, Sirshini Vialin, Roja, MLM in Practice, Eric Lindahl, Robert Scharzak, Anastasia, Wonderbad, JT Chapman, Joseph Shepard, Comrade Amara, Wealth for the 99%, Peter Krauss, Hagen Mitchells, Carlos De Luna, and 23 Skidoo. Cheers everyone, August Slongafoe.